good. Excellent. So, um, what's going to happen tonight? Uh, tonight, we're going to do one hour of presentation. So, uh, we're going to speak about Tuscany uh, geographically and, uh, and uh, on the wine sort of side. And then we're going to present four wines that you have received. If you haven't done um, so yet, you can open the small bottles and uh, uh, empty the content in four glasses on the top of the little um, uh, circles that are on your, on your tasting mats. Um, and then after one hour of presentation, uh, we're gonna lift the, the microphone ban and we can interact. So if anybody wants to say something at that point, what, we, what we're gonna ask you to do is to raise your hands digitally and it's part of the reaction that you find on the bottom uh, band of, uh, of uh, Zoom. And uh, when we see that you got your hands up, then you know we're gonna give you um, a voice, and and you can ask questions or you know tell us about your notes, etc. Um, during the presentation, uh, if you want to interact, there is also an option, and we're gonna use the chat. Um, let's have a look. Fantastic, more, and you find it in the bar on the top, under more, and there is a chat there. I'm just gonna write. Hi, everyone in here. If you have any question, please send your question here in the chat. And good old Paolo is going to take a very good note of everything. And at the end of the presentation of each wine, if you got anything specific of that particular one you want to know, you're itching to know it, please just write in, in the chat and uh, we will reply you. So this is a way for you to be able to participate to the tasting and at the same time uh, avoid the chaos of um, 40 people coming on at the same time. All right, so I think um, we all done with this. Uh, talk about raise hand, uh, question about the chat, the thumbs up, and we can start. Welcome to Tuscany. Um, I can't tell you how difficult it is to sort of summarize what Tuscany can offer wine-wise in, um, in just four wines is impossible. So what we're gonna offer you tonight is an interpretation of things that we think you should know about Tuscany. And to have around, um, uh, to have a look around styles of wine that really define the region. And um, when we talk about Tuscany, and I, I, I'm going to start by um, uh, by telling you about the region itself, wine-wise. You know, or Toscana, as we say in Italian. Toscana is home to some of the world's most notable wines. Uh, it's all names that you must have heard thousands of times. Uh, Chianti. Uh, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, uh, Maremma, Bolgheri, Siena, Livorno, Pisa, uh, you know, Pistoia. If you're Italian, of course, you know very well everything about Tuscany and around it. If you know Italian, it's probably one of the Italian destinations uh, that are uh, the most popular, especially in, in Britain, where um, we coined a, 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 a word to describe Tuscany, uh, calling it Chianti Share. Um, and the, the, the image that comes up uh, immediately to mind is this, um, this uh, background of rolling hills and, and, and vineyards. And uh, anybody who visited Tuscany uh, can confirm that when you get the Chianti area, this is exactly what you see. But also the beauty of Bulgaria, the beauty of Maremma, everything that's got to do with the sea and the special relationship that this region share, both in voice concerning uh, the culture of uh, food and drink but especially for what we're gonna to see today um, for what is concerning wine. And, um, you know, uh, Ima and Paolo will uh, support me in talking about, about grapes, because uh, uh, there are quite a lot to say about grapes, autochthone grape variety, international grape variety in Tuscany. Um, we are in central Italy, of course, um, and, uh, you know, legacy in artistic, um, in artistic, um, uh, uh, subject and the influence on, on the Italian culture is, is undeniable uh, to the point that the Italian Renaissance was born there and has been home, Toscana has been home to many figures uh, influential in, in, in history, in art and science. What do we talk about? What do we say about wine, um, Ima? What are we saying about the wine in there? Well, when it comes to Tuscany, there is a lot to say about wines, but the first thing that comes on mind is obviously the Sangiovese, so the most grown grape variety as red grape in Italy. 
And then we have all of that can be international grape variety as well. So we do found uh, blending the big super Toscan, everything that is a Bordeaux blend. So I can be a Cabernet Sauvignon, a Merlot, as well as some Syrah that you can find in Bulgari. But we start this evening with white wines and Tuscany is well known as well for the white wine selection of his wine. So we can find the Nacho di San Gimignano, for example, and then we have some lovely Malvasia of Trudiano. And today we will have the opportunity to look uh, for uh, Evermentino. But we should know, first of all, that Tuscany is one of the well-known, as you right say, the Bruno, well-known place for the wine in Italy. It counts more than, uh, it counts 50 VOC and almost 20, I think around uh, 18 of them VOCG. That is the maximum, the highest level of uh, um, recognition that you can find in Italy when it comes to quality in the, in the wine. That is actually, Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, just in case, because obviously we, we, we talk in, uh, to all sorts of level of knowledge in wine, uh, the DOC and the OCG denominations are uh, the special denomination that are recognized by the Italian government and that the body of, uh, uh, of control. And uh, they basically, I don't know if you can see the bottle there, um, they are defined by a band and the blue band usually DOC, which is a denomination of origin controlled that guarantees that the wine is controlled by a disciplinary, uh, a set of rules that are there uh, to uh, guarantee the quality of the product, or you get the DOCG, uh, which is a gold brownish sort of band of similar uh, fashion uh, that is giving you a more um, severe disciplinary sets of rules. Um, you know, most of the DOCG wines uh, have obligation uh, of uh, being produced in a certain geographic area and you must do the wine with the, with the grapes that are coming from your estate and, and so on. So if you shop around, of course, not only in our shop, but anywhere you go and buy wine, uh, always look for the denomination because they're not an absolute uh, guarantee that the wine is going to something that you, uh, it's going to be something that you like, but it's definitely there to tell you that somebody, you know, had done quite a lot of work and went to some extent uh, for the wine to be, uh, to be of, of the quality that these sort of uh, um, labels represent. Okay, sorry for the, for the brackets. And yes, I sir. think we should, uh, we should start the tasting. Okay. And uh, we're gonna go for the Vermentino because we can't we can really do this with a dry mouth. Excellent, so let's talk about the area where we are. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the, the, the uh, the estate, and then and then Ima is going to give us a good roundup on the on the grape, and uh, we we'll love a nice um, a nice tasting um, the process. So cheers, everybody! So great to be here. So Bulgaria is an area uh, on the coast, just north of the Elba Islands, um, uh, more or less at the level of Siena, and is a place. Uh, very vocative for wine and historically in what is concerning Tuscany itself um, is a place that is, is, is go a certain magic. Um, uh, the super Tuscans were born and especially, you know, few brands like Sassicaia, Ornellaia and Masseto that uh, some of you might recognize as, um, as, um, uh, as brands and as producers um, have been iconic representation of high quality wines uh, that have been recognized worldwide to be at the top of their game. Um, and also because some producer of Chianti, and we're going to talk about the Chianti rebellious producers uh, uh, and the denomination uh, saga, um, some producer of Chianti decided to go near to the sea uh, to give a different sort of um, um, aspect to the Sangiovese grape and the way to, to obtain a fantastic wine from uh, that grape. But also, Bulgari is the place in which lots of international grape variety have been, uh, have been grown uh, since, uh, you know, the middle of uh, last century. So there is quite a lot of history there. Uh, it seemed pretty, pretty new when I started uh, drinking wine, but now, you know, a little bit of time passed by. And uh, we are uh, with a producer called Campo Alle Comete. 
uh, is a very recently established state. You can see, if you can see the photo on the bottom left, uh, is futuristic building, very modern. Um, and the company uh, is being, is being um, uh, bought out by uh, the big producer from Campania, Feudi di San Gregorio, with whom we have a very special relationship in business. And uh, he has about 21 hectares producing both international grey variety, like Merlot, uh, Cabernet Franc, Sauvignon, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and together with autochthonous wine, especially Vermentino and Sangiovese. And uh, the Vermentino is what we're going to focus uh, with Ima. Yes, the Vermentino, as we said already, is a, a white grape variety that you can find as well in Tuscany, especially around the coast of the same region. But you cannot find the Vermentino all in Tuscany. You can find as well in the Sardinia, for example, the most famous one is Vermentino di Gallura. And then you can find it in Liguria. For the one that will be with us as well for next time, we will have the opportunity to try that shape as well, because the Vermentino depends, like every other grapes uh, in general, uh, depends where it's grown, well, it can give you a different kind of sensation. In this case, uh, we have a kind of Vermentino. The only thing I would say that uh, a Vermentino needs every place it stays is uh, the closeness to the, to the sea. It needs to be next to the sea for, a spo uh, for, um, for, say the best of its, for tell you the best of its shape. Uh, you can see from this glass, you can actually feel the seed that you can see in it. And it's a quite a powerful wine as well. So if you wouldn't be for that kind of minerality, you wouldn't have been able to enjoy this wine. Even if it does have uh, a nice acidity in it, uh, gives you the possibility to be better enjoyable in a way, just because of the closeness to the sea. And I think, the, I think the time is just right, because uh, this sort of sapidity, which is the quantity of sort of salt and salinity, and this uh, reference to the sea, uh, is ideal for aperitif. Uh, and this is because of uh, acidity uh, initiates uh, quite a process in your mouth, uh, uh, get you to salivate, salivation communicate to your stomach, the stomach says, I'm hungry, and uh, you know, the magic happens, and then uh, Mama and Nonna are coming with a nice uh, uh, tagliere and uh, some uh, cold cuts and some, uh, some cheese. And this is where you start the whole process of dining, which for the Italians that are online now, you're well aware is a sort of process. Um, and um, yes, uh, sorry, carry on. Uh, beautiful, the acidity in there and, this, and the salinity, of course. Yes, exactly. The acidity of this wine, I think, is uh, one of the beauties of this grape. And generally, every Italian grape uh, has a high level of acidity. But um, this one in particular gives you the possibility to enjoy everything that is coming around the environment where it's gone. So you can feel as well the flower on, this, um, on, on your nose, a little bit of spikiness that gives more complexity. No, it's not just a simple, a simple drink that you're having, a simple aperitif. It's actually a wine that makes you think about it, what you're drinking in this wine. That's I had a conversation with somebody um, earlier on this afternoon in which they say spiciness in white wine. I thought the spice is something reserved for red wine of a certain body. How is that possible? Well, I think everything that is spiciness can be, can be related as well to, uh, to the complexity of the grape. Like you say spiciness, where you don't know how, what um, the smell is actually like. So you say, okay, I do not recognize these kind of things. So there might be a little bit something exotic, you know, that is not only a fruit, but it can be um, a, just a, a quid more. So add a little bit of pepper, for example. You can call spiciness as well the vanilla that you find in some chardonnay. But I mean, everything that is more and it comes extra to the fruit in your glass, because we have to remind ourselves that the, the wine comes from the grape and the grape is still a fruit. So everything that is extra to what you can um, say coming from the primary process that is the fruit itself, well, I would call it spiciness in this way, in a simple way, of course. Take my take my word with the tongue. I mean, it's a try. I'm of trying course. to keep myself really easily in this way. And talking talking about Vermentino, um, geographically in Italy, I know that today we're talking about Tuscany, but uh, where do we find Vermentino around uh, around the, the Italian uh, the Italian map? Well, the main region are the Liguria and, uh, and, the, and the Sardinia. I would say that the most famous is the Vermentino di Gallura. It's famous as well because 
Yeah, the people um, consider the Vermentino from Gandura one of the most that has the possibility to age as white wine. That is, uh, for Italian wine, really uh, a particular thing. The people do not really believe that Italian wine, uh, white wine, can be able to age for long. And yeah. uh, again, it's the highest city had the power of this wine that makes this happen. Okay, and, and you, you said Liguria, so we're talking about northwest of Italy? just a borderline with actually the north of Tuscany and then obviously the island of Sardinia. I don't know if you are able to see my cursor in here, uh, but yes, this is what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, it's great because Vermentino, depending on where in Italy you find it, it's got different uh, sort of notes and accent. And I think, you know, if Sardinia gives you this lovely expression of the winds and the, the, the sand and a very arid sort of uh, mineral soil, uh, you find in Tuscany a little bit more of sapidity um, and, uh, you know, is, is um, the produce in Liguria of really hard work and very extreme way to sort of uh, grow the plant. So um, I think that um, is also worth a mention. What do you think? Yeah, of course. Uh, the heroic wines in this way you can heroic call it. wines because yeah. heroes are making it because it's yeah, so difficult. exactly yeah, and they cost a lot of money actually because they're quite expensive mm -hmm. how you make it it's not that easy to to make this kind of wine so they have to hand pick the grapes and everything and that they do it only if the the grapes is worth it to do it so i think uh, this is a natural process of choice okay let's talk about the length of the wine as well now that we've done it's nice tasting and I think uh, it's so good that you find quite a lot in it and it's got a very nice length and it, it stays with you for a while. Are you looking at length when you taste the wine? Is that important? Yeah, it is. Especially if you have to have an aperitif and you're eating something with it, you need to have a wine that it doesn't go in two seconds but stays a little bit more. And in this case, you do have that and uh, it's not... I was just say it's not really easy to find this kind of wine or this kind of cessation that you you really have you appreciate your mouth because your tongue is full, but still it's not it's not too much it's not too powerful so you keep drinking basically that is really nice. Good. We have a question from one of us. It's a direct message, so I don't know if she, she or he wants to be um, mentioned. Are the grapes of Vermentino and Verdicchio related? Uh, no, that I know actually. No, no that I don't. I don't think they are. They, no, they, sound, uh, they sound pretty similar, but they are two. Yeah, different. actually, the Verdicchio is cultivated in the opposite side of the Tuscany, so only in the Marche region. So, and you can find the Verdicchio de Castelli di Iesi and di Matelica, but in this case, they are quite different grapes. And actually, the Verdicchio is uh, coming in Italy only from that region, so you cannot find in Tuscany. I'll let some producers start to produce it, but um, not that I'm aware of. So they are Yeah, and as, as much as the two grapes are not really related, it is great that you mentioned Verdicchio, because I think together with Vermentino, is one of those grapes that are not Pinot Grigio, but are good white grapes, and they are known in Italy, but not very well known in the UK. And uh, I had um, uh, a quite pleasant experience uh, watching you and your guest in your live um, in Instagram a few days ago when you were talking about the Vermentino Castelli di Iesi. So if you got the opportunity, uh, hop on into Instagram, find Imas uh, at uh, uh, Wine Not Just a Drink and, uh, and uh, enjoy a little bit of uh, Verdicchio stories. But also, if you um, are with us for the whole series, or if you decide that after today you're going to carry on with the journey, uh, we will have a fantastic Verdicchio when we're going to talk about Central Italy, and I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, and I would say the common point of the two grapes can be the age of potential, because as well oh, yes, of course. And uh, the, Ver the Verdicchio as well stays, if you consider the Castello di Iesi only, stays uh, all along the coast, so it needs to see to develop as well as flavor. So the minerality, yes, is a common point, but they are two different grapes. That is fantastic. We, we said so much. I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, the, finally, this is the moment where I, I, I get a celebrity chef out of the hat. And, uh, he's coming to us uh, on, the, on the Zoom call, but unfortunately, it's not going to happen today. So sorry for this. Huh? But we're going to talk uh, anyhow. We're going to talk about pairings. And uh, OK, yes, it, it goes well with fish. Thank you. We know that. Uh, but where do you see it? Coming up 
nicely with with the white meat as well if you can if you want you can try yeah. some, some rabbit for example doesn't need ah. to be like a wild one because otherwise the taste is too strong but it can be if it can be made like it's just a little bit of tom cherry tomato right mm -hmm. that would be really nice like a little casseruola you know in the pan then you put that yes this. some saltato in padella something that is uh, requiring <laughs> the sun to be out and, and a beautiful wine. For always concerning the temperature is one of those white wines that I like cold. I usually don't like all the white wines at cold temperature, but this is a very leisurely, easy wine that's got enough complexity, enough body and enough length to withstand pairing with food. So uh, excellent choice. And I think we're gonna move on to the next one. Please get the question going. If you think about something later, we can always put it on the board, on the chat, and, uh, and uh, we can um, satisfy all your curiosities. Excellent. Should we, should we go to the next wine and uh, uh, get used to your thumbs up and the reaction section of Zoom? Because at the end of the tasting, we're just gonna do we're just gonna do a very silly thing, and we're gonna vote which is the best wine of the of the tasting, which really doesn't make any analogical sense, but is a lot of fun, and this is why we're here today. Number two, oh, number two, we're gonna go and touch a um, a subject that not even the Italians can get right. So, end of this uh, of this presentation, if you know the difference between Chianti and Chianti Classico, you've done extremely well. And I'm not joking because two weeks ago, we done a trial run for this sort of event. And uh, I've been told off by an ex-director of uh, the Chianti Classico Consortium because I didn't put the Chianti in the right spotlight and I didn't express the difference in the way it should be. So, you know, let's do it together. And, uh, you know, pardon me if I, if I read in letter by letter, but this is serious stuff. Okay, so Chianti, is the name of a territory. So it's the name of, of a place. It was delimited in uh, early 18th century and today covers nine municipalities, which in Italian means basically councils, uh, in the province of Florence and Siena. So um, this is the definition of Chianti as a territory. And also Chianti is the name of a wine produced in nearly all of Tuscany. Talk about Chianti, you talk about a production area that is very delimited in, in uh, where it is, and a wine produced in nearly all of Tuscany. So all this area colored in there are area in which Chianti is produced. But you cannot call Chianti a wine that is produced in the dark green area, which is area of Chianti Classico. Okay. So far, so good. Complicated for me, but if it's good for you, then it's good. So let's go and see what Chianti Classico is. Chianti Classico is the name of the wine made in the geographical zone called Chianti, which was that territory with just nine municipality between Florence and Siena. And only Chianti Classico can be branded by the symbol of a black rooster or the gallonero, as they say. So when you go in your shop uh, or in your supermarket, look for your Chianti, uh, wants to get the top notch and, and, and that particular area which is so attentive in the production of Chianti and which denomination is a DOCG, there are no many DOCG denomination in Chianti, you look for this symbol, the black rooster. The black rooster will give you the guarantee that the consortium for Chianti Classico that defends what I've just tried to explain, I still I haven't got it quite right, but you know, it's written now, so <laughs> we, can't, we can't go wrong. Um, you know, is, is their seal of quality. So you're looking out for the DOC or the DOCG denomination and what's on the neck of the bottle, but you also look for what you can recognize immediately as the brand of Chianti Classico. We started in 1716. We weren't there just yet. Here is Le Corti. Well, immediately, let's, let's taste it. Let's taste, taste first, taste some first. Then we talk and then we go back to it. I love the color. It's that sort of ruby, very typical Sangiovese, but it's got a little bit of darkness in it. And I think that is the 5% of Colorino, like an ink drop inside the Sangiovese. Yeah. And we're gonna see another Sangiovese in a bit, which is a, a Rosso di, di Montalcino. 
same grape, different wine. Oh, this is lovely. Fantastic, 14%. We forgot to say uh, before, the Vermentino retail for 17 pounds. Extremely good value for money. And here we have another under 20 pounds product, uh, retailing our shop for 19 pound 90. And here's a 14%. Wow. And it's got a little bit of, um, of a punch to it, indeed. Let's talk about the producer. Any family, I don't know if there is any family here uh, on our Zoom call that can say the same. Um, they can um, be happy to have uh, amongst their um, uh, ancestors um, a Pope, Clement the... Not sure what is done and uh, at which point. Uh, and a, sign, a saint, Andrea Corsini, which was the Bishop of Fiesole. And the Corsini family members since 900 years ago, they always had a place in local politics, in local ecclesiastic uh, um, fields, uh, agricultural, you know, they've been, you know, president of the consortium, they've been, um, you know, emeritus politicians, uh, uh, presidents of various roles in, 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 in the social life of what Chianti is. The estate is absolutely stunning. They have uh, a, um, a um, relay where you can go and, and, and enjoy a little bit of wine tourism, which is, which is great. And we can't wait for it to start back because I can tell you if there is one thing that I really miss of all of this, you know, is being able to travel there, speak to the producer, taste a lot of wine and enjoy you know, the air that, that, that is there, I think it's just fantastic. Uh, and uh, another note about the, the wine and the producer itself, the producer is um, uh, organic and this wine is vegan. Just go like, I thought the wine is made for grape and all wine is vegan anyway. Well, it, 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 it turns out that actually that's not the case, isn't it, Ima? No. no. So how do you recognize that, uh, you know, how do you know a wine is vegan or vegan friendly? Uh, how, how does it happen? Well, it does have a, should have a little plug or a little sign and brand on your, uh, on your bottle when you buy it. And uh, or you can simply say the V. So it say that it's vegan. What this actually means? It means that uh, it's not made uh, in any process of the production of the wine, doesn't incur any animal um, extra, I mean, there, Any is, product, there are different yeah. products, yeah, there, there are products. Uh, like can be like jelly, eggs. for example, to filter the wine, egg whites can be used as well to clean and clarify the wine itself. So in generally, how you look at the label, or basically if the, the wine is not that much clarified, it doesn't must be that it's not been clarified, so it could be vegan in that case. But there still need to be a certification, so you cannot be sure you can not really be sure. You have to look at the bottle really carefully. Yes, and here you have a little uh, vegan symbol. And um, I think is 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 th there is no animal product in the wine. It's just the animal product I used for the filtering. And uh, what I really got into that about a couple of years ago because I wanted to understand better. And I went uh, to a vegan association to ask them what we can do to have more products that are okay for all their members. And uh, they said, well. The thing that we look um, uh, more and more nowadays is that the use of the manure inside the estate doesn't come from um, uh, any animals that then are destined for, for butcheries. And uh, it, it sort of opened up to me a, a philosophical question that is behind uh, veganism. And, uh, you know, there is great respect for me um, to whoever try to get some new angle into wine. and. Uh, and uh, there are so many producers nowadays that they stop using any animal product. They don't buy any manure from butcheries and, and they, they do it right. We need to remember though, that for you to have a stamp on your label, what you need to do, you need to pay money and not all the producers are ready to pay for the certification. And this is where um, vegan friendly wines are born and vegan friendly wines are the wine that are suggested by your uh wine merchants so you trust the wine merchants you want to have vegan friendly wine not only vegan certified wine your your wine merchant will know the producer and they will tell you that that wine is for you if you are vegan 
Oh, we, we lost Simo again. Okay, let's get back in. There we go. Sorry, Simone. Here we are. I have an assistant in the kitchen that comes out in the window with signs going like, let Simone in, and then she goes back in. Thank you, Mrs. Cerneca. She is the best. Fantastic. Should we talk about the wine? Let's go. Yes. First of all, yes. should, um, we should, uh, there is a question. Yeah, yes, I saw that. Chianti Classico, there is the Sangiovese, beside the Sangiovese de Colorino, if there is any other grape, the answer is yes. There is as well uh, the Canaiolo that you can find the blend. And sometimes there is the possibility to get as well some white grapes in it that can be Trebbiano or Malvasie. But in the majority of the case in the Chianti, you find the Colorino or the Canaiolo together with the Sangiovese where the Sangiovese is the majority of it. And uh, we, uh, as um, Bruno said, in this case, the darkness of the color more than the Rosso di Montepulciano that you have in the other graph is made actually by the Colorino, that the, this grape has a lot of um, content in skin as color, and then, yeah, and then give you the possibility to, to get a richer color in this case and more fruity notes on the nose. The Sangiovese is a, a particular grapes actually, because it's the, you can find in Tuscany more than 200 different clones of Sangiovese. That's because the Sangiovese is the kind of grape that get the shape of the place where it is. So, okay, you is the most grown red grape in, um, in Italy in general. So in this case, uh, you can find Sangiovese basically everywhere, like from the Emilia Romagna, the kind of cheaper one, if may I say. And then when you come to Tuscany, you can find the Chianti, you can find the Montepulciano. So you, you don't really, the question is why there is all of these differences in Sangiovese where the grapes is the same one, because if you had ever the opportunity or like you will have today to try these two wines, why they appear so different? Because the Sangiovese, what it does, it goes to the place and it decides in a couple of years, okay, I will adapt myself. So we change my shape, or we shape, change my character to give you the possibility to enjoy the best of me. That's uh, the idea of the Sangiovese when it comes to Tuscany and everywhere that you, you put it is. That's why you can find the Sangiovese as well in the other part of the world. There are some Sangiovese that are coming from Australia, for example. In that case, because the Sangiovese is so used to adapt himself, itself, sorry. So it's, uh, it's so easy to, to grow on Sangiovese in Tuscany in this way. And when it comes to Chianti, obviously, you do have the Sangiovese as the main part of it because it's the historical grape that they have grown. So I think it's, uh, it's really nice to see, have the opportunity to see this evening to see the difference between these two grapes itself, right? And yeah, the absolutely. And um, you, when, when, when we talk about Sangiovese, let's get a context, a, a sort of Br British, UK context to this. You know, if uh, somebody is lucky enough to have been living like I did in the 90s and the noughties, um, 80s and 90s sort of uh, offered a kind of Sangiovese to the UK market that was very much a Sangiovese um, of uh, mass production, of very high yields. And, uh, you know, it was a Sangiovese you were find, you know, in, in enormous quantity on the shelf of the supermarket. So the conception of Sangiovese was a very sort of common, it is very common in Italy, but low quality-ish sort of wine from Italy, good for your lunch, cheap and cheerful, lovely jobly. That was, that was the idea. And then I think in the 90s, you know, end, end of the 80s, 90s and the noughties, what happened is that there was a generational shift in the Sangioveses. And, and um, uh, when there was one producer that was doing the wine and, 30 growers that they were giving the grapes to the producer to produce the wine, the sons and daughters of the growers came back from university and say, mom, dad, can we just stop giving the grapes to these big producers? Because we have the, 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 the material, we have the grape, you do the wines with the grape. And I studied technology, I studied marketing, I've been involved in understanding how a brand works. And trust me, we can do these ourselves. And this is where lots of these boutique uh, producers start popping out everywhere. And I think it's so fascinating about Italy and Italian wine culture. The fact that you can see so many families, you know, that took the, the grapes away from the, from the producers. The wines are not mass produced anymore in, in, in part. And, and you just find, you know, the, the, those gems of quality just in the middle of the big production area. 
And this is where Sangiovese starts being known as Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, Morellino di Scansano, Chianti, Chianti Classico, and you know, you go more and more, you produce in Maremma in the north. You know, it is, I think it's incredible. And, and I think, as you said, is the Sangiovese is the same grape wearing different clothes depending where it comes from, isn't it? It's like responding to the terroir. You know, Brunello di Montalcino is such a characteristic uh, place where to find Sangiovese in a certain way. And obviously Chianti gives a, a different, a different um, sort of uh, twist to it. Uh, and uh, yes, and uh, it's had uh, quite a lot of power to it as well for this wine, don't you, don't you think? Yeah, it is. But does have a lot of um, a nice acidity as well, so you don't feel it that much. Um, mm. And on the on the nose is more on the primary fluid, so you do have a lot of uh, cherry, like be red currant if you want, uh, a little bit of jammy, but not that much. I think it just need to be more to avoid. A little bit of jam, yeah. You said okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but um, not much, yeah. The nice thing of this one, um, I think that uh, is the use of the cement wax. That is a, an old kind of way of making the wine. So they are not using stainless steel, stainless steel, sorry, but they use stainless using steel, cement. but they yes. use cement, which is concrete, just big concrete vats. Sometimes they're lined inside with a sort of ceramic compound, and uh, they use a lot the the sort of ex uh, thermical excursion between the outside and the inside to um, to um, change uh, the, the organoelectric structure of the wine itself. While if you use wood, obviously there is quite a lot of exchange with the wood that, that makes a filter and obviously, you know, uh, change uh, quite drastically uh, the way the wine tastes and smell. And then obviously stainless steel is the most uh, neutral. Uh, and, and I think cement and concrete is being up and coming, uh, especially recently in many, many producers because they found the right, uh, the right, um, uh, the right balance, and um, and uh, they, they they can find, you know, refine the wine with uh, really some very good angles in there. Very elegant, I say. It's a very elegant product, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a romantic way to make wines for me because it's not like cold with the like the stainless steel, but it's more uh, a warm, you know, a warm mug than the wine comes itself. And uh, the fruit usually is uh, does have a bit of more character in it. It's not just uh, simple fruit, but as an, um, a different evolution. So that's why as well, you can find a little bit of licorice in this wine, for example. But that's yes. a experience. Absolutely. And uh, I, I hope you all enjoy. Uh, everybody seemed very concentrated and seemed, seemed to have a, quite a good time in there. So excellent, thank you very much. And um, what about the Chianti and the, and the Raffia uh, bottle? The, the big yes. Chianti Fiasco. The Fiasco. Yes. I know, I know, all the British people that are there, I know you like the fiasco. We hate the fiasco. <laughs> we can't stand the fiasco. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. The fiasco is part of, you know, um, what happened in Chianti when we were kids. I'm not talking about Imma, because when I was kids, Imma wasn't even in program. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, the, the, the fiasco was a very good uh, symbol of Chianti. And I saw some producers nowadays going back to the fiasco. But I like also the fact that the fiasco has got a double meaning in Italian, because it, mean, it means when something goes wrong is a fiasco, and this term sort of uh, transmit into the into the English language. And I, I find these things very funny. Sorry, you're supposed to laugh. I know you're all mute, but I can hear you. You cry, fantastic. Good. How are we doing with timing? Oh, we're doing uh, very badly because uh, we're a bit late. Okay, let's go uh, to Montalcino, Ima. Yes, the Montalcino, yeah, here we find a different expression of Sangiovese in this case, uh, a more elegant way and uh, in the balsamic notes of this one, if you, if you want to try, uh, on the nose is totally different, it's not based uh, on the fruit, but also on the more complex aroma that you can find, but let's back to the beginning, as you said, I'm quite, uh, I, I, for me, it's really easy to get lost in the wine, and I'm sorry for that, I'm sorry for you that you have to hear me. But yeah, Montalcino is a little hill near Siena. So we are in the southern part where the production of Chianti Classico Tiki is. And uh, it's a, a really little town, but it's famous actually for the production of the Sangiovese Grosso. That is one of the clones that have been discovered by the most famous producer, Biondi Santi. 
that is the first one that uh, starts to produce Sangiovese Grosso in Montalcino. And so he creates basically the idea of Brunello di Montalcino itself. Then what happened? Uh, in this class, you don't have a Brunello di Montalcino. That would, be, that would have cost you really more than did you pay actually today. This is a Rosso di Montalcino. That is a more enjoyable way of trying to name because for making the Rosso di Montalcino back to the, to, to the rules that there are and the government, the Italian government made to make this wine so great, you have to wait at least four years and two years of aging in oak, Slovenian oak in this case. So you have, uh, you have to wait four years. And uh, in a normal world, I mean, like uh, the producer have to do some money before these four years because they have to wait the grapes, then they have to make the wine that they have to wait for years. So what they done, they create an, another, um, they create another, uh, Type another type of um, of yeah, declination of the of the Brunello. Yeah, inside to the Brunello, that is the Rosso di Montalcino. The Rosso di Montalcino is uh, a different shape again of the Sangiovese. That see the wood just a little bit. In this case, you have a Rosso di Montalcino Mastroianni with only six to seven months, depend of the vintage of uh, wood used. So what that means? That means that in your glass there would be more fruit than can be in a Brunello. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Let's get to it. Yes. Did you already taste it? It's nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. What can I do? I love it. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. I think that that's Paolo's favorite, isn't it? And you can see the color compared to the one before. This is the color of Sangiovese. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as the age, because this one can be, can be aged for a few years. It doesn't go on for 20, 25, 30, 40, 45 years like the Brunello. Uh, but then it gets some nice sort of garnet um, frame around it, and um, uh, it, it's beautiful. And uh, in here, you can feel that the, the, the power and the structure is also given by, by the oak. Yeah, you do have some taste of vanilla in this wine, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. One of the main recognizable scents of oak. Yeah, especially in your mouth. But the first thing, uh, as I was saying, is the balsamic note of this wine is so is so nice, almost a kind of eucalyptus that I can find in it. Mm, it's beautiful, very very nice. And um, what we haven't done though, because we were pressing for times, so we haven't spoke about Mastroianni as a company. Mm -hmm. Now, Mastroianni as a company is uh, linked to names. Of course, Gabriele Mastroianni, who founded the the estate in uh, seventy five. Um, and uh, one of the very early recognizers of what Sangiovese Grosso had as a potential. Uh, and, uh, you know, he really committed himself to develop the beauty of the terroir and the Sangiovese. And then Andrea Marchetti and Maurizio Castelli, uh, manager of the estate and winemaker, that really sort of got the success of the brand in a secret. And the secret was, uh, the secret was, we want to do a wine that is non-interventionist. This is the, the, the word they use, non-interventionista in, in Italian. And they say, we have an incredible grape. We have a, a, a terroir which is vocated for growing this sort of grape. We don't want to intervene too much. Each vintage is going to be given by what the um, vintage is offering. Uh, with uh, whatever the season I can can offer, whatever the yield can offer, and you know, working in this way was you know very early stages of what uh, the organic movement said. But they didn't need that because they were working organic before anyway. So um, I love this sort of style. Um, we were discussing uh, last time uh, the difference between Bordeaux producers and uh, Burgundy producers where so much is being done uh, by the winemaker in Bordeaux and so very little gets done in Burgundy. And uh, every time you go in Burgundy, each and every place you go, go different terroir microclimates and, uh, and, uh, and the winemakers are just taking what mother nature's give them. And it's, it's a different approach. And I think this is very similar in this case. And, uh, and then obviously something that is very near to me uh, because um, uh, I'm a good friend of, uh, of Ricardo. Uh, 
in 2008, uh, the company uh, got bought by the Ely Group. Now, if somebody think about the, I think is group number one in coffee in the world at the moment, or definitely in the top five, buying a very small producer of Brunello di Montalcino, Rosso di Montalcino, I think we're talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about no more than 100,000 bottles, 20,000 bottles of production. Um, the first thing comes to mind is, oh, here we go, the big corporate is buying this, uh, is going to transform it. It's not going to be the same anymore. And exactly the opposite happened. You know, they have been, the Ely family, non-interventionist on the management of the actual estate. And they, they gave all their expertise in marketing, in positioning of the brand, in international development, to make it one of the most recognizable brands nowadays. And uh, I always remember uh, hosting Ricardo for an event in, uh, in Vini Italiani back in 2012 and being stunned by the enormous knowledge of Ricardo, which is a coffee man, and the passion that he has for, for his estate. And I think as long as the Ili family is gonna be behind Mastroianni, we have a very good guarantee that what we're gonna get is a top-notch product from Toscany. Salute. <laughs> Oh, some, some love it. Oh, very good. very good. Super, yeah, super. Fantastic. Very, very good comments. Thank you very much. Hmm. Beautiful. Good choice, Ima. Good choice. <laughs> um, we, we all like a little bit of super in our life. Um, and I want to uh, welcome our uh, guest that can unmute herself. We have uh, uh, Letizia Bernardini, who's the um, hospitality manager for uh, Poder Nuovo a Palazzone di Giovanni Bulgari. Welcome, Letizia. Whenever you're ready, you can unmute yourself and uh, take part on, on this next uh, uh, and last, unfortunately, tasting for the evening. And we're going <laughs> to move away from what the area is until... until uh, ciao, Letizia. Ciao, Bruno. Hi to everybody. Here. Hi, hi. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna speak a little bit about about the craziness that happened um, around few producers that weren't really that happy uh, about how the denomination. Do you remember that the famous DOCG denomination, the Black Rooster, um, the disciplinary that if you want to have a label, you must obey what the discipline of that label is. So. Few of them said, you know what, um, I, we don't really like that 20%. You know, there, there, was, there was a regulation inside uh, the disciplinary of Chianti Classico that was yeah. saying that you can use up to 20% of, of white, white grapes. And a revolution, yeah. uh, I, I think it was in the 80s, wasn't it? A revolution came out and said, we're not going to do this. We're going to do the wine as we want it. And we don't want your denomination. We don't want the Black Rooster. We do as we want. And, and this is how these rebellious producers of uh, Sangiovese uh, moved to the area of Bulgari and they said, we're gonna do it. Actually, it, it started with Tignanello uh, in, in the actual Chianti area. And we're gonna produce a Chianti Classico that hasn't got plant Chianti Classic on the label. And this is how Tignanello was, was born. Um, mm -hmm. And this producer started with Sangiovese and then they welcomed the, the way uh, the French were developing Bordeaux and the grape varieties that were sort of defining that particular cut. And, and they, they just start using it and, uh, and with great success, producing wine of a uh, very high uh, recognizable success worldwide. And I think, you know, in this area, we got quite a lot of top 90s and hundreds points from the various uh, uh, worldwide wine personality. And I, I think it's just, uh, it's just, it's just striking how mm -hmm. Somebody just said, I had enough of all these rules and the history. Yeah, thank you very much, 17, 16, whatever. But this wine is the top. I'm going to do it as I want. And I'm just going to define it as a vino da tavola, which is the lower denomination, in which you don't have anything guaranteed, if not the labels of, of these producers. And we speak about Super Toscans because Giovanni Bulgari, uh, that started for the Nuovo Palazzone, which is a beautiful estate in, in Tuscany. I think we are a borderline between uh, Maremma and Lazio, right? On the, on, the, on the south side of Tuscany. 
he, exactly. he produces he produces these uh, incredible blends. We're not going to have a blend today. Today we're going to have a Cabernet Franc, and I'm going to pass the the the, uh, the microphone to to Letizia now that she's going to tell us everything about about the estate and the wine. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I like is the character of Giovanni itself, part of the Bulgari family, a family that is in the world of fashion, of perfume, of hotels, of anything you want to do. Uh, I have one member of the family. <laughs> One member yeah. of the family say, I do wine. I don't care about anything else. This is what I'm going to do. And he committed to it uh, to create something extremely special. Letizia. Yeah, exactly. He's kept to jewels, to another jewels, another gems from the nature. So wine and the new adventure starts in uh, 2000, approximately. Because uh, Giovanni and the Mr. Paolo Bulgari creates, uh, starts to produce wine in 2000 in the area. And in uh, 2009, uh, they start to produce not only for friends, but for everybody, luckily for us. And they uh, decide to, to produce not DOCG or DOC, because uh, we are in the area for Chianti Coalicenesi, but uh, Giovanni strongly believes that we can produce wine differently, gives stronger uh, and uh, uh, it gives uh, the intensity to the different grapes varieties so we can exalt uh, each one because we have a really particular soil. You uh, told to everybody that we are in a particular area because we are in Palazzone, that there, it's a real small, small village uh, near uh, San Casciano dei Bagni. But honestly, we are just two kilometers from Umbria region and just four kilometers from Lazio region. So it's the last uh, corner of the Enknaun Tuscany where we are. And the soil, it's really particular because we are really close by the mountain, Cetona mountain. It's not really famous like Amiata and the other ones in Tuscany, but it's a really beautiful mountain that we have. It was a vulcan. So the soil, it's really rich, it's really mixed with important calcareous stripes, in particular in one of our vineyards that we have in front of the, the winery, where we produce the Cabernet Franc. But not only, we have uh, uh, other different varieties and we strongly believe that uh, it's much better to have wine with a really um, particular characters, not only from the DOCG, uh, probably because we are in uh, Anknaun corner, as I told you, near um, the, the other uh, really famous area for production of wine, as well Montalcino or Montepulciano. So we prefer to produce wine that reflects exactly the soil, the people that uh, works in our winery, and uh, the perfect uh, grapes varieties. In particular, Argirio with the Cabernet Franc, as you told you. Uh, and uh, it's a particular Cabernet Franc, as you know, because usually in Italy, when we say Cabernet Franc, uh, uh, you know, the, the mind flies to France. My next challenge uh, is that one. Uh, probably in one, two years, when we say Cabernet Franc, uh, the minds fly to Tuscany and to Palazzone, I hope, because we produce a different one. Uh, it's a Cabernet Franc, so with the characteristic of these grapes varieties, but of course uh, with a different expression from the soil. So first of all, uh, it's really mineral, uh, it's really intense, it's full-bodied, but the nose it's really different with respect to the regular uh, Cabernet Franc. We like to say that, uh, Giovanni like to say that uh, it's a really particular nose that we have. Probably you have the wine on the glass, so you can agree or not. But uh, you, can, uh, you can smell it, uh, a really important, uh, um, important smell that we have on the, on the Cabernet Franc, that is the pepper. But it's not a regular pepper, green pepper, uh, as usual in Italy, but it's a different one. It's a ripe pepper. We like to say that it's a really Italian pepper because it's uh, more like, I don't know if you know, but it's more like a, a sort of a frigitello. So it's a ripe or cooked pepper. That's our characteristic in this wine. But uh, um, the, the, the full bodied and important structure, of course, uh, is the same of the Cabernet Franc. It's the same of the, the regular varieties, of course. 
Wow, this is uh, on, only talking about it. Obviously, make us want to have a look at the. So um, let's let's taste. Let's taste, and um, is our final wine. I I welcome the comment of everyone. Um, Ian has this suggestion of inviting the wine the the wife at eight o'clock to take advantage of the full hundred mils of the tasting. I think that was yeah, was very good, and it looks like we have a new a new capo, which is Ilaria who's complaining about the size of the tasting. Um, in the description of the, of the tasting, I did warn you uh, that the, the tasters are just enough for two, but obviously ordering two sets will make for a much more interesting night. So uh, if you didn't read that, that very small character, and if you want to uh, review your order, of course you can contact me and we can fix that for next event. Um, Tell us about Giovanni. When did he start and, and why? Why wine? Uh, well, Giovanni starts to produce wine in uh, 2000, approximately, in the area. Uh, he had uh, an old house uh, nearby the, the, uh, the winery. Uh, but uh, honestly, at the beginning, uh, he produced, and the, 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 the father too, produced wine just for family or for friends, as is usual in this area. Uh, then in 2009, he decided to uh, leave totally the jewels company and uh, he decided to move directly in Tuscany, uh, to live in Tuscany. And uh, luckily for him and for us too, uh, he had a really important friend that was an architect. So they start together the, uh, the adventure. And uh, he asked uh, to Mr. Albizi, the architect that was a student of Mr. Renzo Piano. So the really famous wow. architect. Ren the Renzo Piano uh, is the one that designed the shard, just to give you an idea. Yeah. And also the other beautiful colored building uh, uh, at the bottom of Tottenham Court Road, and oh, how, how many, and so many. Uh, yes, we got Soho in New York. He's, he's, I think, probably now one of the top architects in the world, and uh, you know, he's, he's landscaping uh, the world at the, moment, the the city landscapes for sure, for sure. So yes, yeah. uh, a, a lot of attention, obviously, in design and a beautiful environment Absolutely. for which to relax and drink wine. Do you have hospitality there? Obviously, you're a hospitality manager. Absolutely, no? yes. Uh, I'm the manager of hospitality. We're all invited. <laughs> so We're all let invited. me invite you and uh, everybody to visit us as soon as possible. Stay safe and come to drink one, uh, one glass in Poder Nuovo because it's a really beautiful, uh, beautiful area. So it's really quiet uh, and uh, it's sunk now in the corner of Tuscan. So really, really beautiful to, to discover. Absolutely, yes. We but really Giovanni, have, as, yeah, as I told yeah. you before, um, decided to produce wine because honestly, even before, uh, from the beginning, uh, it was more for nature than for the life, chaotic life in the, in the town in Rome. So he spent a lot of uh, holidays and uh, part of the year in Umbria, where he had the other uh, farm and uh, in Tuscany, uh, in, in Palazzone. So he preferred to live in the nature and uh, to, to have other, other interests, uh, not, not only in jewels. So uh, he decided to move and to start a new adventure, absolutely. Fantastic. And he's very private, isn't he, Giovanni? It's very difficult to track down. He doesn't talk much in public and uh, um, <laughs> I, I, he's, he's sort of keeping keep it, keep it for himself. So uh, he promised me that during this year, uh, I'm gonna track him down and interview him in an event that's gonna be done virtually yeah. again, but just uh, concentrating of the four wines that you do. You do a lovely white wine called Nicoleo. Uh, yeah. You do a, a, a super Tuscan blend of Montepulciano, uh, Sangiovese, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc called Terra. And then you mm -hmm. have um, uh, Argirio, obviously the Cabernet Franc. And you do a beautiful Sangiovese and impurity, impure impuretta, uh, which yes. is called Sotirio, which is the, 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 the top of the game. And uh, yes, um, uh, I can't yeah, wait you to, 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 all, welcome, all our to welcome labor. you all. Sorry? I can't wait to welcome you all back and uh, to have a conversation <laughs> just, uh, just for your wines, because uh, no, it's, it's but... a beautiful story to be told.
Yeah, but I have to reveal one thing. Giovanni, it's not too private, but it's too shy probably to, <laughs> to speak nah. with you. <laughs> so comes here and you can meet Giovanni, absolutely, everybody. <laughs> Fantastic. We do the real tasting as, as soon as all this madness uh, ends. Right. Why not? Why not? Absolutely, yes. And uh, just uh, one curiosity about our labels. All the labels um, are dedicated to something, of course. And uh, we start with, uh, with Sotirio, that it's our Sangiovese, that it's a real tribute to the founder of the brand Bulgari in the world, because Sotirio Bulgaris was the great great grandfather of Giovanni. It was a really strong man. He dressed always uh, in black, so that's the reason why we have the new label in black and silver. And wow. uh, Giovanni is really, really attached to this figure. So he decided to give a tribute with the most important wine that we have. It's a really small selection. Then we have the white wine, as we told you before, Nicoleo, that it's dedicated to the two sons of Giovanni. So we start from the beginning of the brand to the last generation of the family. Nico and Leone are the sons of Giovanni. And uh, then we have Terra, because we dedicate the blends to our soil, to our Terra. That's the Italian word for Terra. And uh, Argirio, finally, that we are tasting now. It's uh, Argirio mean, uh, uh, come from Argilla, the Italian word for clay. Uh, it's exactly what we want to, to, to point the attention, because in our vineyard where we produce the Cabernet Franc, we have a really important presence of calcareous stripes, of clay. And uh, when you will be in Poder Nuovo, you can see that it's a really different color on the soil. It's really gray because it's a red clay that we have that gives strongness to the plants, to the vines and to the wines at the end. So uh, that's the connection between the name and the wine that we have. That is absolutely amazing. Imma, we want to hear from you, my colleague Sommelier. What do you think about this uh, yeah. Cabernet Franc? I think it's a nice expression of Cabernet Franc. It's uh, more um, mature, as Letizia said, actually. That's, uh, that's totally true. It's not that uh, really peppery, but on the mouth is a, is a full body wine, but still uh, a lot of elegance in it. And on the nose, yes, it's more mature. So you have the frigitelli, as you say. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So I would say a cooked. That, that's Italian, the, the Italian hearts that speaks, so you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, I understand. I totally understand. Uh, I know that this is the favorite one of Paolo. You already pointed the last time. He said that um, Argirio was his favorite. He, he is a fan of the... Um, Cabernet Franc. Yeah, Cabernet Franc. Especially when it's uh, 100%. I, I love it. It's really powerful and uh, but it's in the same thing, in the same time, it's a really it's a drinkable. So, no stressful that you can feel it that you don't want any more glass. But I already finished my bottle, so I agree with the other. With the other with that the doesn't other. qualify as a bottle. Sorry? As a bottle. It's a very small bottle. It's not yeah, bad. exactly. So I agree. You can say I finished the bottle. <laughs> I think he's I think he's incredible. I think he's very particular. Um, I have a question uh, from John. Uh, what do they do in the wine making process to achieve 15% strength? Uh, what a question. Okay. Uh, do you want to take this, Ima? Should I start and you finish? Um, I think that, that there are various aspects. So the first one is what the, 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 the fruit gives you. So the level of sugar present in the actual um, grape, uh, that when it gets obviously transformed into alcohol, the more the sugar, the more the alcohol. So that's the sort of natural uh, way to go about things. Um, and do you want to add anything, anything else, Ima? And then there is in the wine, in the wine making process, there's not the strength oh. in alcohol that actually uh, gets into play, but is the character of the actual tertiary, uh, as we call them, the tertiary flavors. Would yeah, you agree, exactly. Ima? Yeah, uh, let's say that during the winemaking, they can control the fermentation, so the amount of alcohol that it can be produced. But obviously, if you want a dry wine like this is, uh, you have to uh, make um, 
make all the sugar transform in alcohol. In that case, what helps you is to have a complex flavor in the wine that is able to support when it's 15, um, 15 strength of alcohol. So it's a really strong wine, but if, to, if I have to be honest, uh, I cannot really feel it that much. Maybe in 20, mm. 30 minutes I will feel it and I will let you know. <laughs> does, it, does it do, Letizia, does it do malolactic fermentation? I think it does, doesn't it? No, it's only the... Oh, it um, no. Because it's the, very the, soft. You would say it does, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, consider that it's 15 degrees in alcohol, but it's really well done, so you can't feel it a lot. You feel it after you finish the bottle, not before. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, this is fantastic. Uh, we, we didn't talk about, about pairings. Uh, None for the for the, uh, uh, the Chianti Classico uh, or for the Rosso di Montalcino. And I have to say something extremely controversial here, but uh, I think the best application for the Chianti Classico, which is a vegan wine, is a nice, juicy, uh, grilled, uh, carbon-infused uh, Chianina steak. <laughs> uh, you know, a really big cow that's been sectioned uh, to pieces for our pleasure. And I'm sorry to say that if anybody here is a vegan, uh, but I find, the, I find it quite poetic that a vegan wine is really well dressed up to, to, to eat meat. Um, and I think that's one of the characteristics of the Chianti. Uh, but of course, you know, very tasty sauces I will go for, um, vegetables, spicy foods. Um, I think the Rosso, I will go for something a little bit more elegant. I will, I will go for venison. I will go for, for sort of, uh, Tastes are um, a little bit softer and uh, more um, um, recognizable so that the wine can fuse very well with the food. Some light sauces, some creamy sauces, some really nice sort of food like that. While I think all the, the Bulgari selection, uh, due to their power and due to their spiciness, etc., I like to think that this is a wine that is very well drunk with exotic food. Um, and I'm talking about you know, it's very difficult when you talk about um, eating food uh, like uh, um, Indian or, or Thai. Uh, if you don't go, obviously, to the really sort of spicy spectrum of it, I think if you, if you have some mildly to, to a little spicy, uh, it, it's quite difficult to find the wine that go with it. And I think uh, in the range, you can find quite a lot of this. Wouldn't you agree? Well, it's really difficult to to pair a, a spice one, a spice food with uh, with wine. When it comes to alcohol, it can uh, it can be too powerful in that case. So it can it's going to cover the spiciness. But yes, if you put a little bit like a, as an Italian would say agrodolce, then you can balance it. So yes, Indian food would be would be a good option, but not too spicy. At least not for me. <laughs> <laughs> not for you. Um, roast duck. Uh, would be fabulous with roast duck. Yeah. Yes, yes. Because the, ro the duck has got that sort of uh, depth to it. Uh, the, the depth of the duck and the wine. Yeah, it could be very, very good. Absolutely. Having spicy food now, is that Mimi? So how did it go with the spicy food? Goes well together. Thank you. Don't tell anybody I paid you. Please don't. <clears throat> right. That's fabulous. That's oh. perfect, yeah. <laughs> So um, I think we more or less uh, go to the end of the presentation. And, uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad to say that in a second, I'm going to take the recording off. And we can start proper interaction. And we're going to try this really odd experiment to take everybody's microphone off. But be careful, because you're a click away to get muted again. So behave yourself, especially <laughs> you, Roberto, because I know you, Roberto, and I know how much you talk. Um, and. Um, I'm going to find out to stop the recording. I don't know how, but I will. Uh, and I just wanted to thank everybody. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that after the tasting uh, and tonight, uh, after I, I, I put the recording on YouTube and I uh, have done uh, everything that I need to do, I will send you the presentation so that you can have it. It's part of the deal. I will remind you, uh, I will remind everybody who bought this event uh, only that obviously they are free if, uh, if, if you want to, uh, to buy the next events, and I'll have a special deal that I'm gonna email you for you. Um, and um, and um, uh, the other thing is you should have received, uh, if you bought the, the event online, you should have received a discount code 
be careful that if you just bought this event, your discount code is going to be valid for only 48 hours. So it's, it's a race with time. And I think uh, we taste some beautiful wine. I wanted to thank um, Ima and Paolo for being there for me and for making this happen. I wouldn't have done without you. Thank you so much. Everybody for taking part, especially Letizia. Where is Letizia going? Ah, she is. Letizia, thank you very much for jumping in. Uh, we thank you. Have, thank we you very much. A, uh, we usually have a, a, a lovely guy called Francesco, uh, <laughs> but I, pre I prefer Letizia by far. Don't tell him. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, let, let me see how I can take this, uh, this recording off. Uh, very well with this. Stop recording. I got it. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I see you next week.